Well, is there a better fairy tale analogy to use to define this type of market? So, in a recent note, you had Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Comac Mullen. Uh, he wrote uh, that Hansel and Gretel may be the better fairy tale analogy. A brother and sister who came across a house made of candy that was too good to be true and found themselves in a battle with an evil witch. Joining us now is David Bonson, the Bonson Group founder and CIO and author of The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. Um, is that an accurate description of this flowless, loveless rally to record highs? It's an interesting analogy because there's a sense in which it certainly works and, and the question really becomes how long does that analogy stick? You know, at what point does you, do you transition into a real high conviction level one way or the other. I don't feel like the bulls have a great deal of conviction about sustainability, and I certainly don't feel like the bears have a lot of conviction. So we continue to float around. We're now making new highs, and everything seems to be, yeah, but we're waiting for this, waiting for this. I, I'm more and more wondering if the best thing that could happen for markets is that the China trade deal continues to be the thing that's going to happen next month, and then next month, the next month. Because as long as it doesn't blow up, there's still the optimism around it, and as long as it hasn't happened, happened yet, there's not that worry of selling the news. So do you pay attention to things like RSI's, technicals and things? I'll put a chart up here that yep. suggests that we're... David loves them. I love them. This I love them. All over that. Alex has taught me everything I know about them, actually. <laughs> we're, we're actually pretty much up to overbought status here, according to RSI. I don't pay any attention to it at all, and it's not that I don't believe it has any merit, and it's not that I don't uh, read it for my own intellectual stimulation, but as far as our view of markets and the way in which we construct an asset allocation and execute in a portfolio construction, it's not part of our process. But you are right that technically there is a lot that feels overbought into the market. The problem is that you look to other indicators, and it's the, the contrarian side of things, besides the fact that markets have had this price movement, there is no data suggesting that, that we are in some kind of a euphoric buzz around markets. The flows are not suggesting it, and so I think there's offsetting indicators. But what's causing the huge rally? Because I mean, looking at it, it seems to me it's an absence of a negative. It's not a positive. It's, so we're not going to have interest rate yeah. hikes, and we're not going to have a trade war with China. Well, those are all nice things, but that's not affirmative growth in the economy. No, it is not, but there is affirmative growth in the economy as well. And more importantly, markets are always and forever. This never changes. Discounting mechanisms. They're pricing in today what they believe about tomorrow. And what, and what you said has to be added to where we came from fourth quarter. Yes, there's now an absence of rate hikes. There's now an absence of quantitative tightening, which is the bigger factor. And, and I think that that there was an over discounting that took place around this earnings recession talk. We're early into this earnings season, but even apart from how Q1 year over year is going to look, the market is now saying, you know what, we're not really going to have a full year earnings recession. It's not going to end up being 2019 year over year earnings contraction from the year prior. That's what the market had priced in. So I still think what we're doing is making up, we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves. We were too far behind yeah. previously. Just correcting from past I, mistakes. I think so. Okay, David Bonson of the Bonson Group will be staying with us. All right, back to the breaking news in the oil space. Occidental offering to buy in Darko now for $76 a share, 20% premium, trying to outbid Chevron with a $65 a share. Uh, no matter how much sense it might make for Occidental, the question is, can they get it? And earlier, Alex and I were talking, I said, the board of Anadarko has to be very careful to make sure they can justify the deal. You say they don't have to be all that careful. Well, I think that they have to be careful, but they're being careful by looking to the post-deal ramifications. You put a headline number of a share price, and supposedly Anadarko is offering more than Chevron. First of all, we don't know that that's true because 50% being in stock, you're going to have a ratio right. that adjusts it. The market pushing Occidental stock down, the Anadarko's board has every, has every reason right. to fear that. Now, Chevron's put stock on the table as well, right. 75%, but it's Chevron. There's right. a very defensible position to why that's a more stable stock price. Well, what about leverage? But the biggest issue is leverage. Post-transaction, right. the debt level that Chevron will right. have pro forma is only equal to Exxon's leverage ratio. Post-transaction, right. Occidental will be three times the leverage rate go. that Chevron's at, that's the biggest so. reason that they can justify going with the Chevron offer. David says you got to look at the balance sheet. Yeah, and taking a look at Caterpillar, that's out at, as well. First blush, the revenue looking pretty good, coming in $13.5 billion. Estimate was 13.4. Apparently they had a record first quarter uh, profit for sh uh, per share. Um, they are investing in services and sort of their operations, but at least for this, it looks like it could be paying off as well, so that's not uh, up 
by over 1%. But we'll, we'll continue to see as sort of more information winds up coming out. Their outlook for the year, I should say, high end, $13.06. Uh, and, and even as you've been talking, there's a red headline crossing. As I said, the earnings per share for Boeing are $3.16, a, a miss off of 325 but they're suspending their forecast. They're not even going to predict mm -hmm. going forward, it appears, is the red headline crossing right now. Well, so, David, let's go to Boeing because you own Boeing. We you do. know you know Boeing. Is it all about the 737 MAX right now? Well, as far as their suspension of forecast, it's entirely about that. And, and is the stock price entirely about that? No. Uh, it, it, in terms of where they go going forward, they can't give a clear indicator of what the impact of free cash flow will be. 737 MAX was a significant contributor to free cash flow. And that's not going to go away. The question is what the timing is going to be when they get back online. I think it really defies even the most bearish of bears uh, sensibilities to suggest that this is going to represent a permanent impairment, but it's going to disrupt the timing well, this year. Well, permanent's a long time. It the is. The question is how big and for how long. And I'm it's, guessing it's, six months and five percent. Oh, so you think it's over in six months? Yes, I do. And it's 5%. It's not just free cash flow, it's also margin, as I understand it. Isn't it fairly profitable? This is a higher margin for... product, so it affects overall margins. But Boeing trades off of free cash flow. They become effectively the second biggest free cash flow generator in the S&P 500. And ultimately, their commitment to returning 100% of free cash flow to shareholders via record level dividend growth, which is our bread and butter, right. and they've been a big stock buyback company, that's what's driven the stock so high over the last three years. So six months and 5%. When you say 5%, is that off of where the Boeing share price was before the 737 crisis? Um, yes, at the, from where it was at the peak. So that would suggest strongly that you should be buying Boeing right now. It's Not necessarily strongly. I mean, remember, right now, after this, the stock is up 16% on the year. I wish all disasters could be so bad. The stock is up 16% since New Year's Day. So, so the, there it isn't a screaming value in it either. It's just the market doesn't really believe this is going to represent a secular shift in Boeing's viability. So the other earnings that we just got out a few moments ago is Caterpillar. Uh, they see their 2019 earnings estimates on the high end of $13.06. So they are citing some tax benefits. Well, the, the art issue with Caterpillar, we don't own it. They are a good dividend payer. But see, we like that sort of non-cyclicality of their dividend growth. And Caterpillar is very lumpy. It's a very cyclical business. And, of course, last year you had all the kind of external China concerns. We happen to not have a position. So, David, from your perspective as an investor, how much do you take into account things like whether China's stimulus will kick back in and really re-stimulate? The economy over there. We take it into account in a completely contrarian way. The more we believe a company is dependent on China doing something stimulative, uh, the, the more we would w avoid the name because we're just simply delaying a day of reckoning. It's of no interest to us whatsoever. That applies to Europe, by the way, just as much as China. So when you're taking a look at China and sort of the green shoots we were talking about just like 24 hours ago and potential feed through then to say Japan and Europe, how do you play that? Well, I think that as a U.S. equity investor, it's going to help kind of sustain the macro environment. So much of the sort of clouds over U.S. equity investors coming in the year were global concerns. So the more that things sort of are held together, Europe, Asia, et cetera, uh, the better environment it is for U.S. But what we don't do is take direct exposure into those uh, companies. We, I think that that area still is problematic. And to the degree that it ends up working out well or you get a good bid there on a risk-reward basis, we still think it would be inferior to U.S. or emerging market opportunities. So with us here is Richard, uh, David, I want to say Richard, ba Richard Branson, that's not your name. David no, Bonson of the Bonson no. Group. But, <laughs> but the two of us put together are worth billions of dollars. There you go. <laughs> so it's, it's not a bad um, balance so, sheet to attach to. Exactly. So you have European <laughs> banks looking at their best month in four years. Value trap? Oh, absolutely, value trap. No question about it. They're, these are just deeply balance sheet impaired companies. And so some of the stock pricing gets so low, you have a really viable trade there. But fundamentally, we know the macro issue with Europe and we know the underlying bottom up balance sheet problems. They're mostly untouchable. If someone's put a gun to your head and said you have to buy a bank in Europe, you'd certainly rather go Swiss than German, though. Okay, so let's pretend that we have extended uh, Teltros from the ECB. We have some yeah. tiering when it comes to the deposit rate. Does that change? change your opinion? Uh, it wouldn't become more investable to me because any macro space that's attractive in that environment for European banks is going to be just as good for JP Morgan right here in Manhattan. To me, it's just a safer way to be exposed to global financials. Okay, many thanks to David Bonson of the Bonson Group.